It's a pleasure to be talking to you about you know, finding success in graduate studies. I was, too, once a graduate student, believe it or not. Don't let the gray hair fool you. I actually used to study and try to be in a situation you're in, wondering what in the world I'm going to do with myself. I hope that everything goes OK. Um, so please feel free to ask questions, stop me, whatever. OK, this is, this is for you. Okay, And I'm just kind of here to help guide things along. So you know, I don't know about you, but I find like graduate studies to be nearly sufficient to make you go to drive you to drinking and go straight to the bottle, really. Um, there's sometimes when I was studying grad studies that I really thought that thought about it. Um, you know, why put yourself through this? Have you ever asked yourself this question? Why? I think we all kind of have to go through this once or twice in life, and definitely graduate studies. If you're not asking why, then either you're entirely too smart or, well, I don't know, but yeah, I have to ask why. For me, let me just take you briefly of what kind of drove me a bit, um, especially you know coming here, doing my research here, why would I want to do that to myself when probably I could be doing something else that wouldn't be giving me gray hair. And if you go back and look at Grand Challenges in Engineering, it's the National Academy of Engineering. Anybody heard of that organization? Right, yeah, some of you may have, some of you have not. Used to be, it was full of a bunch of old men that sat around and chatted and they had like a country club. They decided for themselves, you know, what was going to be important for the country to look at in research into the near future. And they'd shake each other's hands with secret handshakes or whatever, I don't really know. But the point of it is, is they come up with these ideas as to what was important. More recently, they've been trying to improve the, the representation, the National Academy of Engineering, putting women on there, putting you know, people from minorities on there, people, people from other places in the world on there. But they're not doing a very good job. Anyway, whatever. But you might take this as an example of ideas that might be worth considering, keeping in mind it is a bunch of old men, mostly. For example, you know, advanced personalized learning. How do each of you learn? I guarantee it's not the same as how everyone else learns. And that's an important thing to consider. How do you actually learn yourself? And as an educational institution and that you're a part of, it be important to try to consider how can you actually get people to learn most effectively and the best. How do whatever it is I have in my head, I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but how would, whatever it is I have in my head, can I reconstruct it so it's inside your head and then you get the benefit of whatever it is that I've learned. That's personalized learning. Then there's other things like mo make solar energy economical. That's already done. Uh, that was done in China for the most part. Virtual reality. Well, goodness, Apple solved that problem. Just for $3,500, you too can have right, virtual reality goggles and divorce yourself from the real reality, which who wants to live in that reality? Then there's a reverse engineer of the brain. A lot of reasons that you might want to do this. Why do we have to just trap, entrap our existence in this poorly, poorly formed object and, that we carry around? Right? Why can't we have more? Why do we have to, if we have an injury, communicate with vocal cords and a moving thing on the bottom of our head, right? and you have to listen to me with a couple of holes in the side of your head? Isn't that really odd? There's a lot of ways to consider how you would reverse engineer the brain to escape from that existence. There's also the engineering, the tools of scientific discovery. Most common place where you see that is uh, space sciences, you know, the, the web telescope. But there's also the fact that there's super resolution microscopy, holographic microscopy, and other sorts of things as well that make this possible. And then down here at the bottom, there, there's nine more topics, but down at the bottom there's this aspect of engineering better medicine, where it says explicitly, engineers are developing new systems to use genetic information since small changes in the body, assess new drugs, and deliver vaccines to make a positive impact on human society and its existence. So this is a bit dated now, but this is an example of what people think when they think about that topic. This is Bill Gates' graph of the year 2013. And you look through it, OK, so kind of a complex graph, really. We have um, like pink stuff, and then we have uh, green stuff, and we have yellow stuff. Right, so the yellow stuff is all about infectious diseases and birth problems, things that you either catch or are born with. The green are environmental issues, 
driving down I-5 and some idiot cuts you off, you run off the road and you have an accident. Um, the red, you're stuck with due to genetics or bad choices. Lifetime of cheeseburgers causes you ischemic heart disease. Unfortunately, this is one of the principal causes of death. We all know, right, that it is the leading cause of death, death in humanity. But, and there's stroke here as well. The, the intensity of the color is also informative. Stroke is one of the leading causes of death, but it is not growing that much. That's the reason why it's a bit light colored. Whereas on the other hand, typhoid, relatively small box, but it is darkly colored, indicating it's growing very rapidly. So Bill Gates, for good reason, liked this graph 10 years ago, and it still is relevant today. You know, it indicates, for example, that natural disasters are the, by far the fastest growing contributor to the death toll when it comes to injuries. And that's because, in part, due to global warming, we're having a lot more issues. But you know, you won't have to ask the question, is this really enough? And I would argue that it's not. I mean, you could use this as a basis for saying, well, I'm going to work on this chemic heart disease because it's the biggest, pie, big, biggest piece of the pie, right? But there's more to the story in the sense that you know, if you listen to the press, here's the causes of death in reality on the left-hand side. And then we talk about media coverage from the New York Times, a reasonably respected newspaper. And, you know, the distribution is rather different. And the media coverage of The Guardian, for example, is another widely respected news newspaper. Google searches, which is interesting because it tells you what people really worry about. Um, they're rather different. So, you know, we can have Bill Gates' most popular figure of 2013, but then we have to see what reality is, and then we consider what we actually hear in the media. It's the, our perception of reality is shaped by what we hear and read and see. Here's what we hear, read, and see, that terrorism is a big deal. 35% roughly of the media coverage is due to terrorism. Homicide is almost a quarter. Heart disease is 2.5%. <clears throat> in reality, what kills us, 30%, of us are going to die from heart disease. Terrorism, less than a 0.01% chance of being killed in a terrorist accident, terrorist incident, sorry. So, you know, media doesn't quite get it right. Same way with Google. A lot of people Google cancer. For good reason, it's a leading cause of death, just right behind heart disease. Very few people Google heart disease. Probably one of the reasons is because if you have heart disease and have a heart attack, you're not there to, to actually console Google anymore. But maybe I'm just being cynical, but you know, terrorism, homicide, and suicide are much larger as things that you Google search compared to what happens in reality. The reason I mention this is, is that you know, organizations like the people that work at uh, New York Times and The Guardian are supposed to be well-trained in actually presenting how things are in reality, and they will convince you that that's how re things really work. And so you might be Decide, you might decide to work on something based upon what you read in the newspapers. That would be a mistake. There's also this aspect that concerns me most is that there's worse things than death. I mean, we're all going to die. That's just kind of how it works. But what arguably is worse is when you're alive actually suffering for long periods of time. And there's this concept called the disability adjusted life years. So it's a measure of overall disease burden expresses the cumulative number of years lost to ill health, disability, or early death. So we go along, we have a healthy life, we catch COVID. We catch it again, and then we catch it again because, you know, that's COVID, even though we had the vaccine and we get the blasted thing three times or something. And then, you know, we get to the point to where, well, we don't get over something, whatever it is we've caught. And that leads to disease or disability. Some people live with a disability for their entire lifetime, and that's actually important consideration in all of this. And then that leads to an early death, meaning a death before you reach your actually expected lifetime. Communicating this, though, is difficult. Can you imagine seeing something like this in the New York Times or The Guardian or like searching for this on Google and it's like, oh, I found what I was looking for, right? Not going to happen. But if you look at it, look at what happens here. This is, this is disability adjusted life years on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis is from like zero to six days to 80 years. And so, you know, from right nearly beginning of, of birth and this is how long you might expect, these are the sort of things that would uh, affect you most as far as diseases are concerned. And you go through and then there's the diseases of the elderly. So it's busy, but you know, 
part of the reason you're in grad school at an institution like this is because you're smart. And so you're able to make sense of things like this. Now look, over here to the right, this green, big green blob is cardiovascular and circulatory diseases, principally a disease of the, of the old. If you get you know, heart disease, the amount of life that you have left, maybe not all that long. But on the other hand, you've had a long life so far to live. Now compare that, say, to diarrhea and pneumonia, lower, lower respiratory disease, right? That actually kills nearly a similar segment of population, but it does so to the young. So when Bill Gates shows that most popular plot, right, it doesn't actually really represent it in a way that points this out, that infectious diseases are actually principally affect the young disproportionately um, with the population in terms of their age, whereas cancer, this big red spot, mainly older people. Right? So that also should be taken into consideration how you would actually, what it is that you would actually do. You know, and, and my argument here is, is that you know, engineers can actually do this sort of stuff. You can figure this out, you're smart people, you're actually trained to actually read graphs like that and make sense of it. If we sat here and talked about it long enough, you'd know what was happening. And so you also, by the way, are supposed to create and shape the future. For me, it was actually seeing some of that to help me make decisions on the sort of work that I wanted to do with medical devices, for example, the sort of things I wanted to look at, like pulmonary delivery vaccines and and disinfectants, that kind of stuff, right? So, you know, now that you're here, you, you, you're trying to do whatever it is you're doing, one of the things that is important to remember is that you as an individual can really make a huge difference. And I think it's in the institution's best interest to try to help you realize that. And then as an individual, you probably may think that, well, you, know, you can't make a difference. Well, Bill Gates was not Bill Gates for all of his life. Sociopath, for sure, but, you know, when he was first getting started, he was very controversial, didn't really complete school. He had a lot of trouble raising funding and doing whatever he wanted to do. He was an individual, just like each of you. So, you know, that, I like the saying, if you, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try sleeping with a mosquito. And you, individually, you can make a difference, believe it or not, if you just keep biting enough. Okay, so about that, you know, I want to talk about what matters, at least what I was think about matters in the graduate degree. You know, the research, the whole of it, communication, learning, pursuit of novel directions, in generating new knowledge, and to try to work with integrity. This is the official statement that we always he hear and see and read. It doesn't always work out quite that way, but we would like to hope for that ideal even when reality kind of intrudes from time to time. Journal publications are the currency of research, at least in our department. CSC is welcome to their idea that, you know, conference papers count, good luck to them, whatever. But in our department, you know, journal papers actually matter. Uh, teaching and training, though, is also important, right? I mean, if you do this long enough, no matter what kind of career you choose, you're going to end up teaching somebody something. And knowing how to do that well, man, that, that, you're worth a lot if you can do that well. If you can run a team that can learn from you, it can be very effective. And you'll spend your career doing that, really, teaching others. And the better you're at it, the more successful you'll be. There's also a matter of a community. The old saying is, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And unfortunately, that's actually true. We can talk more about that. I have a particular example in mind, in fact, um, to help try to form a community amongst yourself and your generation and people among you. And also, hopefully, like with faculty and the staff here and whatever, is it like a team? Try to make things work. I don't know about you, but I think research is like watching a car crash in slow motion and being in it. It's just like stuff flying and glass breaking and metal bending, you, you know, you're bleeding from the head and all of that. And you're just lost and confused. And that's actually a good sign when it comes to research. Because if we, if we knew everything, then we'd, like Tony Robbins said, you know, we'd be billionaires with perfect abs, right? Even fake abs. Um, another way to put it, you know, and Einstein has often said, to have said this, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research, which is true. And I've used that line in reverse as said, well, I have no cl clue about what we're really doing. I mean, after all, it is research. 
Even the quote isn't really known where it came from, which to me is kind of funny because, yeah, anyway. So where do you start, right? We could talk about a lot of things today, and I, I'm told I have, well, I have about another 10, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. If you want to talk about any of these things, I'm happy to do so. Communication, time management, stress management, setting goals. I'd like to pretend that I have some ideas on how to make those things work because at one time or another in my career, I had to think about each of them, and I still do a terrible job on some of them but I try. We're human. So I'm going to try with communication. Let's see how that goes. If you have questions about the other things, we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, you know, communication outside your group is really vital. And building a network of colleagues, your friends, is vital to your future. And not just because you might ask them for a reference letter, but it's just funny how, like, many years later, you find that you'd actually be helpful to know people. I mean, I still talk to people when I went, I went to grad school with, one of them is uh, a, a director of a fuel labs program at Oak Ridge National Labs. Another one is at Pacific Northwest National Lab as a director of a research activity there. Just really helpful to, to know these people. So, you know, we think, okay, well, communication, who cares? You know, it's the science of what matters. And I, I'm, you don't know this, but I, I put on a top hat and pretend this is me. I'm actually really introverted. I hate being up in front of people, and I'd like to just hide in a corner, and Stefan probably knows. I mean, he knows that I rarely show up to anything, but, but I like to hide in my office and then work on things and then let reality intrude only rarely if possible. Um, but the fact is, is that communication is really important. It's wonderful that you're doing things, but you have to talk with others to make it recognize that you're the one doing them. I'll give you an example, Douglas Prasher. Anybody heard of him? Yeah. GFP. GFP. One person. Right. Out of what, 30? He invented the GFP molecule. Arguably, he should have won the Nobel Prize. Green fluorescent protein. Anybody know what green fluorescent protein is? Yeah. Most of people doing experiments have used it before. Even when you don't use it in biology, you use it for other sorts of experiments. He used to drive the courtesy van to Penny Toyota in Alabama. And I will say, and never let it be said, that if you are happy with driving a courtesy van, a Penny Toyota in Alabama, that's freaking fantastic. Because what matters is that you are happy and satisfied with what you're doing in your career. And don't let anybody ever tell you any different. However, in his particular case, he wasn't especially happy. Now, it turns out that he actually returned to UCSD because after all, he used to work at UCSD when green fluorescent protein was discovered. Um, meanwhile, though, while he was driving the van, Osama Shimomura of the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, and then Martin Chalafi of Columbia, and then Roger Cien here across the campus, um, won the Nobel Prize kind of on his behalf, but they forgot his name. Yeah. So a lot of it if you read the article, it's kind of old now. It's an April 21, 2011 uh, Discover Magazine article. The main reason, he failed to communicate. They didn't point out the fact that it was him that made a discovery, and he was kind of a difficult guy, introverted and then kind of a jerk, and so people really didn't engage with him that much. And it cost him a few, few uh, connections, and that ended up being all that was needed for others to win the Nobel Prize for his invention. So, with communication, you know, there's ample opportunities for misunderstanding. Because of our varied backgrounds, and I have to say, I don't know about other groups or whatever, but I kind of think it's generally true within our department we try. Um, I personally, the more diverse my group is, the more people that come from everywhere else, the better. And the reason is that we look at exactly the same thing and see something totally different. You look at that clock on the wall, that means something totally different to you than me. And it's remarkable how much a difference that can make. But that also leads to misunderstandings. Remarkable number of misunderstandings. We look at one thing and it means something different to you. Or your behavior towards me, because, well, I'm like the professor, and you, when you're someplace else, professor treated differently than I would expect when I'm here. I mean, when I was working in Australia, I was always James. I mean, it didn't matter who I was talking to. I mean, freshman student out of an undergraduate class had called me James. And I have to say, the first time, it was kind of jarring because I was then working in Japan before, and I was always friend-sensei, friendo-sensei, and then, so it was very formal. 
And then you go to Australia and they just call you James, 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 James all the time, right? And then Suj is one of the students in my class, or one of the students in my group, for example, you know, was a you know, professor, professor this, and I'd like, wait a minute, a little bit unusual, right? So, yeah, that's just in a title. Imagine what would happen if it's a research topic. PIs have a lot of responsibilities that students generally aren't aware of. Every Wednesday, um, I have from about 12.30 to 5, sometimes 6 p.m., um, to look at a bunch of files that talk about how other faculty are doing across the university, and we pass judgment on whether they're going to be promoted or demoted or who knows what, right, because of things that they've did or not done. And that takes my weekends, usually, too. So most of the students aren't really aware that I have that sort of stuff going on, right? Also, writing proposals. Writing proposals is like um, uh, suffering in slow motion um, because, you know, one out of ten will be successful generally, and the other nine you write, you, another, other nine you write for the fun of it. Um, but then you kind of have to figure out, realize that there's no fun to be had. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a bizarre experience. There's these other things that you have to do, right, to just keep things going. Students aren't generally aware of, and thank goodness, we try to protect you in a way. I mean, some faculty are not very good at it, but they, generally that's the perspective. Students, they also have a lot, right? And it's, it's, it's horrible. Sometimes you can't afford to, to eat or live, or they don't give you a living wage. I mean, what the hell? And faculty generally aren't necessarily completely aware, but we're just trying to survive keeping the doors open. Lots of opportunities for mis miscommunication. It's a problem. Even if the communication were difficult, uh, were perfect, we already have a difficult job, students and faculty, you know, trying to get along and make things work. Research is tough. Internationally competitive research is tougher. It's one thing to actually try to compete from, with Bob down the road, you know, SDSU or those, those, that terrible university, UCI up there. I mean, come on, you know. Or in that, in that very inflammatory sweatshirt there, the UCLA, right? Um, but let alone having to deal with people from Europe and China and wherever, you know, uh, that might publish your work for you a few days in advance of when you were going to do it. And then funding it, having them pass judgment on your proposal to do the work that you want to do that they th were thinking they were going to do, and then giving them the opportunity to tell, say no, man, you know, it's, it, it's tough. And for a lot of students, this might be like the first real job. If you're doing this kind of right, it probably will be, because if you do this right, you're supposed to try to kind of rush through this to get the PhD, go to a postdoc, and then before you turn the age of, what, 28, you know, you want to be appointed in your first faculty position. That's sort of like what we all kind of hope for if you're going the academic track, or if you're doing like, you know, the entrepreneurial track, you want to be, become a billionaire before you're 30, right? So you kind of had to get through all of this educational process soon, because Unfortunately, we're not getting any smarter as we get older. I will tell you that that is the one downside. As you get older, you don't get any smarter. So, yeah. You know, sometimes when miscommunication is a problem, you know, remember that it might not just be you. Some PIs are just terrible at communicating. Um, they're really hopeless. I mean, like, the, you know, protesting medical doctors. Can you imagine how they would fill out their signs, right, you know, with their handwriting? It's up to you, really, to decide. You have to kind of have a cold, hard discussion with yourself as to whether it's worth it. You have to decide sometimes if you want to make up for the failings. And they are just human. Sometimes it's hard, and you may not be a good fit. Just, you may want to work on the science together or whatever. That all stuff may, may work, but other aspects may not mesh. So, but anyway, in my case, what we do with my group is that before they even join, they initially have a discussion with me, and I'll try to give them this sheet, and I, we try to go through some of it on the expectations. Meaning that, you know, okay, not only what I expect from a student, but really what they also can expect from me or my group, because that's important too. I mean, I think it's a two-way street. It's not just everything is imposed as a burden upon the student. It's also my responsibility to look after the student too. That's equally important. So there's all of this stuff, and we try to keep it on a, a single page to talk about different things. Like, do you want to pursue patents and make lots of money? A PhD may not be a good fit because they're kind of at right angles to each other. So here's a few thoughts on the communication aspect. You know, when meeting your PI, uh, try relationship banking. I learned this the hard way. 
um, because I kept going into one of my advisors. I had two advisors for my PhD, one in ceramic engineering and one in mechanical engineering. One in ceramic engineering is really, really helpful, so I used to go to him to my worst problems, with, with my worst problems, you know? And so I go in and talk to him, and I said, well, what good news do you have for me today? And I was thinking, oh, what, hey, I'm, you know, and he said, hey, I'm only human. You can't just come in with bad news all the time. You have to kind of like bring your ba bank balance with me back up. And if you make it positive, then I'm happy to see you more often. But if you're always negative, then I funny how I'm always busy. Right. If you ask for help on a problem, offer a potential solution. And the idea being is you need to make a withdrawal and then you make a deposit back. Say, so, well, you know, this, this, this method really isn't working at all, but here's what I was going to try to do. And it doesn't have to be right or whatever, but at least you're trying to bring your bank balance back into above zero. The PI will say, I'm really good at this, um, will provide poor ideas. It's not because they're just bad at whatever. Well, maybe they are. I don't know. Maybe that's me. But maybe they don't understand the problem like you do. And the sad reality of it is, after a couple of years of the PhD, you, you really understand the problem better than anybody. That's the scary part. Okay. The PI can really only help to guide you. One thing I would suggest is that, you know, you never be afraid to bring bad news. Um, some faculty are better at handling bad news than others. I've known a few faculty that, not, none of them here, but um, would blow up at bad news. But I think you won't have that problem here, I'm hoping. So here's a thought on what you could bring to the conversation, like integrity and honesty, willingness to not take it personally. A lot of things that go wrong are learning experiences. I'll give you an example of perspective I have with research is that a month of research, you have one good day and all the other days bad. So if out of 29 or 30 days, those are bad and you get one good day, that's actually a good sign meaning your experiments could continually go wrong. Because if it didn't work out that way, with the balance that way, then it really isn't research. Because you have to do a lot of things wrong before you get a little bit right. And you just repeat and repeat until it starts happening. Um, faculty tend to be ridiculously busy, and it's their own fault, because they say no far too little, like we were talking earlier, and say yes far too often. But a university like this one, they end up getting caught in a lot of stuff they have to do. It's this time pressure stuff that we were talking about. It helps to try your best at leading the work as much as possible, because the more that you can actually lead it, the more that you actually become the leader, the better opportunity you actually have to be seen as the person that knows everything there is to know about that topic, and no longer your PI, which is fantastic. I mean, I. I I really like it when I see students develop to a point where I just kind of hide back in the corner like um, Homer Simpson, you know, hides back in the, in the bushes, and then the student takes over. Like, I have a student now going to D.C. today to present something, and I don't need to be there because she's the expert. Um, positive attitude always helps. I have had students elsewhere before when, like, everything is always wrong, the glass is always half empty, it's always raining and every which direction is always uphill. And that gets to be, they're miserable, you're miserable, and it makes experience miserable. But as I said, you know, it's not just on students, it's also the faculty member. And what you really have the right to expect is enthusiasm. This person is doing this, somebody like me, because they wanted to be here, and they wanted to be here so badly, they were willing to jump all the hoops of, on fire to actually become a professor and then continue to do this for however many years to get to the point that they're at. It's fair enough that they should be enthusiastic about whatever they're wanting to work on with you. The other part is sensitivity. I would argue compassion, actually. But should, the faculty should be aware that like, life is not all rosy for grad students. And that if they don't, then there's, there needs to be a discussion. Appreciating individuality. So each of us is different and how we work and, and think about, especially if we have a very diverse group, each student is really different. And that's fantastic. And appreciating it is just more than just saying it, actually making it work. You should deserve respect. I mean, you're adults now, for God's sake. And you deserve respect from people that you're working with. Okay. 
and it should make, be, be available. I try to make myself as available as I can, especially for my graduate students in my group, because they matter most in what's actually happening. Last thing is actually quite underappreciated is the skill in the art of asking questions, and good questions at that, and actually getting, getting, asking questions that if answered, then actually addresses the problem that you're really trying to address when you go and see them. Okay, so that's sort of wanted to talk about, about communication. There's a lot of reasons why I developed this talk. Um, I had a PhD student in Australia that um, was actually a PhD student of another faculty member, and he contacted me on the telephone and in, in abject terror and distress, like once a week, and he wanted to talk to me for over an hour each time, complaining about the existent, you know, the situation with his PhD advisor, and the advisor was treating him really badly. And so we talked and discussed and worked out it slowly got him kind of on track back, and he completed his PhD actually with me here. And um, I thought we weren't going to make it. As an example, I, I show this, this image on the back. These are carbon nanotube bundles. And we were looking at breaking up those bundles using an acoustic method um, because carbon nanotube is old news, but they, they form micro bundles. And if you want to use them as individual nanotubes, it's a lot of trouble to get individual carbon nanotubes. Well, he did some 600 SEM images and uh, several, uh, somewhere in the order of 15,000 um, experiments with high-speed cameras and over a period of eight months, working like 20 hours a day, seven days a week, just to get the data for this. And I only knew about half of what he actually went through to get the results that we got for this, this paper. But because he wasn't very good at communicating, he got into distress with his first supervisor, and then I didn't know that he was working so hard. And um, eventually he completed his PhD, went off to the Bay Area, started working for startups, and made actually a lot of money now. But he struggled. And so I make this for him. All right, thank you. So, I, I'm told that we have like communication about different sort of things or whatever. Um, there's some recommended reading. I think we'll, we'll have the slides available for you. So if you wanted to read more like the subtle art, subtle art of not giving a, okay. And that's a really great book. Um, the No Asshole Rule. Uh, there's also these sort of uh, somewhat pop psychology books in a way, but they actually will provide helpful perspective on how to get along in a group and so forth. Um, but there's also some other, if anybody has other questions like, um, Sorry, like time management and you can take a picture, yeah. Time management and other aspects, uh, managing stress, managing time, that type of thing. I'd be happy to discuss, but please take it away. I'm down for time management discussion. Okay, let me see if I can find that. Okay. So, I don't know if anybody knows who this, this, have you read this comic before, the PhD comics? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good for like comedy relief when you're suffering through the graduate degree. Um, also, it helps me because, you know, this is kind of true, how they actually spend your time. This is not quite true. Teaching here is much less of a part of the pie than research, but, uh, you know, the departments really want you to spend 250% of your time. Um, if it exists, yeah. So, anyway, um, and how we really like want to do is to basically not be told how we want to do anything. Otherwise, we wouldn't be a professor. So, anyway, first suggestion would be to try to find a routine that works for day, for you, something you can do every day, kind of a similar way, and so that you don't have to think about it, you don't have to exert any of your valuable mental resources in order to like get through the day for whatever it is you're doing. You can spend all your time thinking about scientific issues or engineering things, things that kind of matter to, to your degree. Um, so, you know, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence in is not an act, but a habit. And if you can re improve 1% a day, then by the end of the year, you know, you're well over one third on your way to being a better person. Just a little bit of change every day helps. It's important to have a life and to take the computer and throw it away. I'm dead serious that, you know, I'm always being switched on is a fantastic way to be miserable. 
Would you rather spend all of your time, you know, uh, you know, looking at computers or whatever, or wasting time and so forth, or hoping to actually get some work done and being miserable, looking at the computer and thinking, oh, this sucks, having to process this data or whatever, and I'd really love to, it's a beautiful, out, I mean, here, my God, you know, you, you look outside, and well, not today, but most days, you might like to go outside and smell fresh air and look at the, that shiny thing in the sky that they say is the sun, right? It's actually good for you. Working long hours is not a measure of personal quality nor, nor future ex success. It's definitely an American thing. Say, so, oh, you know, I worked 120 hours this week and I didn't sleep at all. I feel wonderful. Right? We all talk to people like this. And, you know, if everyone was just a little bit less lazy, we'd each win a Nobel Prize. No. Make the best of the hours you are working and limit them. It's more about quality over quantity. It's really important. There's an association, direct association with screen time and depression amongst US adults. And if you think you're not susceptible to depression, you're wrong. Practice creative absence. And this means disconnecting off of email, uh, Slack, Discord, telephone, that modern instrument of the telephone. You know, we all love talking on the telephone, right? Um, that stuff wrecks your productivity, provably. Not just me saying it, it's provable. So um, try it, especially like on a weekend. Pretend to have a weekend for a change. Something that does work for me um, is like a Pomodoro technique. Anybody heard of the Pomodoro technique? It does actually help, yeah. I mean, I use it for a while and then kind of forget about it because I get too busy and the 25 minutes grows into three hours and then, gosh, shoot, you know, how many Pomodoros with that? It's like, gosh, screw it. I'll just. I'll just go back and then, and then like, oh, I'm, I'm feeling miserable. I'll do Pomodoro. Whatever, it will help, probably. 25 minutes on, five minutes off. For the 25 minutes that you allocate for yourself, do one task. That's it. You give yourself permission to work on that and only that for the 25 minutes. So the rest of the time, you can work on whatever else. You know, sort of the, the, the mini James talking in the back of my head is saying, you have so many emails to answer. You have that review for whatever journal to get done. You have the cap stuff you're supposed to do and the blah, 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 blah. And talking to yourself, right? Or maybe not. Maybe you're well, well adjusted, unlike me. I don't know. But the point being is that Pomodoro technique works not because you have a cool looking timer, but it's because the 25 minutes, you give yourself permission to work on one thing and one thing only and tell that little voice to shut up and come back in 25 minutes. There's an other aspects. This is actually for writing. If anybody has writer's block, anybody have any writer's block for like writing a thesis? All day, every day. Right? Yeah, it's amazing how I just, yeah, don't get me started. Anyway, um, I was going to write so many papers and yet, yeah, so um, this is from Robert Boyce. I've actually studied why new faculty um, most new faculty have problems with writing papers. And how do you actually develop a, a process to overcome that issue? How, why do they don't not write proposals? When it's in their own best interest to write as many proposals as possible to get funding in, grow their group, and then, you know, I don't know, declare victory, I guess that's what happens, right? Um, here's some key ways to overcome writer's block, and then, for that matter, figuring out how to handle research more generally, is to wait. The way you develop patience. One of the contributors to writer's block and so forth is actually impatience, believe it or not. Counterintuitive, but you wait. You begin before you feel ready. And the idea is that some people get this idea that, okay, I'll, I'll start working on it when I have everything kind of arranged. It'll never happen if you wait for everything to be arranged. You have all the information you need, or you have the results you're looking for or whatever, it's not gonna happen. You'll be waiting years. So it's better to just start a little bit. Work in brief daily sessions. It's better to write 30 minutes a day for a whole year than it is to try to write one week straight. Stop means when the 30 minutes run out, to really stop. Say, I wrote my 30 minutes, I can go out and, I can go out and see the, the sun and drink beer for the rest of the day and party at the beach. Right, that's what everybody does. Surfing, has anybody learned to surf? There you go, see that's, that's, that's what I expect. You're living here in San, San Diego, yeah. So you stop and then go and enjoy yourself. 
balance preliminaries with writing, outlining, and so forth. The outline is, is really valuable. Because often we'll try to write something and we think we'll just freehand it, but then we end up having to throw it out because it doesn't actually conform to any sort of format. Um, Self-defeating thinking and habits. Um, you know, you kind of have to learn to be your best friend in your head because no one else will be. And especially when you're alone and there's nothing quite so lonely as being a researcher. You have a lot of people telling you, giving you advice on how to do things better or more correct or right or whatever, but they're not actually tell you you're actually doing okay. You need to be your best friend. Manage your emotions. Um, I used to write, when I was, remember when I was first working in Australia, we had automatic lights in the building and I would start after having lunch, I would start writing, I was writing a few things, and I would notice the lights were out and look down at my watch and it was 7 p.m. And I had lost those seven hours. And it was manic writing. Don't do that. Um, let others, even critics, do some of the work. If you're in research groups that are pretty good, then you can ask actually others to help you, believe it or not. And you get something sort of part of the way there and they'll, they'll actually help you. Um, limited wasted effort. Actually, if you're here, you're probably taking care of that. There's not much to talk about there. Try to remember that you can't do everything. Probably not going to even be able to do most things. In fact, even doing a little bit is going to be pretty hard. You have uh, 8,760 hours in one year. Sounds like a big number, but if you start subtracting off, well, I need you know, two hours of sleep a day, right? And I need 30, 30 minutes to eat three meals, or, right? Then you start thinking about it, you end up with very few hours. Well, what are you really, what's really important to you to get done? to be happy with your goals that you have set for yourself. Is it to actually answer all your emails? I doubt it. Consider really what's important, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so anyway, that's, that's my advice for time, time management. I don't know if there's anything else you want to talk about, but. Setting goals. Setting goals, yeah, okay. So goals, everybody's good with stress? Hmm? Have plenty of stress? Anybody need any advice for stress? I see one person nodding in the back corner, but she's a troublemaker, so I don't know if I need to believe her or not. <laughs> Sorry, say again? Sheer stress. Sheer stress. Exactly, right? Yeah. Bad engineering joke, man. Let me, let me go through, quickly through stress and we'll talk about the goal setting. Um, Feel like you're going uh, crazy, you're not alone. Graduate school is hard. If it wasn't difficult, everybody would do it because you know you just you can make millions after you fit. Sorry, yeah, we know the reality, but um, you really only do it if you want to do it. And then you ex often have to ask yourself why you do it when you thought it'd be a great idea earlier in your life. Why did past me tell future me this would be a great idea, right? Yeah. Um, look, I remind myself of this saying all the time because it actually helps is if you can solve your problem then what is the need of worrying and if you can't solve it then what's the use of worrying if you sort of stop and think about it that's every problem one thing you sure don't want to do is don't compare yourself to others is it a com competition between yourselves and other other students sure i mean if you don't have 11 published papers, then you're not going to be as competitive, say, somebody from UCLA or you know, Caltech or whatever that has 23 papers in nature and whatever. That's just sort of how it is, and that person's going to get offers for whatever. Does it mean you're going to be any less successful as a human being? No, no, it does not mean that at all. Uh, and thinking this way, uh, being really competitive and letting it get to you will make you old very, very quickly. Like my bad joke is that being a researcher isn't stressful at all for John, who's 23 years old, as you can see here. So, right? Okay. A sure way to lose is to compare yourself to others because the stress and the un a constant worry will preoccupy you from doing what it needs to be done. Adopt the Pareto Principle. And I do this with a little bit of worry because there's faculty in the room and so where's me saying this to students when they're here, but the point is 80% of your output is a product of 20% of your efforts. That, you know, you're getting a paper put together, 
then that last polishing step seems like it takes 80% of the time just to do the polishing. And the, the thing is done, right? Usually you don't have to go through that so much effort and cut off activity when it starts being, you start, you start having problems with getting a lot out for the time that you actually spend. Start something new, you can get a lot of progress for a short amount of time. Up until then you start getting dwindling returns on your investment in time, right? The trick is learn where you cut things off. I put this quote up here because I kind of always liked this, right? I don't know, it always gives me positive boost in the sense that this guy was, you know, a baseball player and said, when I'm in a slump batting, then I comfort myself by saying, if I believe in dinosaurs, then somewhere they must be believing in me. And this whole, whole thing sounds just ridiculous, but it's something that a baseball player would say, but I don't always liked it. And if they believe in me, then I, then I can believe in me. I mean, if a dinosaur can believe in you, then surely you can believe in you, right? And so in this case, you know, they said, when I, if I can believe in me, then I, then I just bust out and start batting and going crazy. So anyway, have a life. Work is not life. Work is only a part of it. Try to develop a life outside of work. You can work 10 to 12 hour days, six days a week, and you cannot produce more than about 12 hours a week of productive results. It's provable. You can pretend, sit in front of the computer, and like, oh yes, I, you know, uh, professor, I'm putting in a tremendous amount of time and effort. Look at how busy I am, pick, 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 you know? That's not how it works. The only thing you can get done about a couple hours a day, you can really have incredibly productive work. You protect that time. And the rest of the time, protect yourself. Because only you're going to look after you. It helps with stress to express gratitude. Be thankful you're here. I mean, you could be in Nebraska. We could be having this meeting in Nebraska, right? Or in, God forbid, North Dakota. Maybe some of you don't know where North Dakota is, but believe me, it's not a place you want to live. Okay. So, you know, it provably helps to take the time to be actually grateful for how things are going. That helps mitigate stress, believe it or not. And then prioritization, we talked a little bit about it before, but you can do anything, but you can't do everything. And in fact, you find it very challenging to do very much at all. It's a good idea to either delegate or just delete most everything you're doing. And, you know, the person that came up with this diagram was Dwight Eisenhower. You're all too, entirely too young, and I, even, I'm too young, right? But the point of it is, is that he was a general that helped the Allied forces bring it into World War II in Europe. He came back, was president, developed the, the, the highway system across the United States and, and passed through a lot of legislation that actually protected the right of rights of many Americans. And um, he's a busy boy. Yet he still found a way to play golf every Sunday. Don't be hard on yourself if you fail. Because you're going to fail all the time. The number of times I've gotten a grant proposal rejection. Man, if I'd won all those grants. Jeez. Anyway, we are wired to be self-abusive. The reason you didn't get that grant proposal is because you suck. I can just hear that in my head. Reason that the, the reviewers hated that, that paper? Because you suck. It seems like there's a kind of an echo in here, you know, you know what I mean? That you don't let yourself do that to yourself. You need to be your best friend to counter that voice within. What would the friend say to you? And then be that friend to yourself. Remember that it's also there is help. There's other people you can talk to. Um, we can upload this. This is actually a, a British thing, but it's actually pretty informative how to have balance so that you can actually have a real life. Um, you might say that, well, I'm, I have too much to do to justify actually having a life for myself. It's, I'm in a graduate school of a short period of time. I need to work hard to actually make it to the end. Be surprised how quickly you'll burn yourself out and how miserable you make yourself. You can, you'll get more done by taking care of, of your time, by protecting it to have a life, than you will by just working all the time. If you're really having trouble, then there is help, right? So there's, there's wellness and there's people to talk to. And don't ever hesitate to talk to them because they, they can help put a different perspective on things.
Okay, so that's, anyway, that's about stress. So, goals, uh, SMART goals. Anybody ever heard of SMART goals? Some of you have, some have not. I always hated the, the acronym SMART goals, but it's sort of helpful uh, to make them the specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and timely. Let me explain each of those uh, briefly. So specific, you know, a specific goal has a much greater chance of being accomplished than a general goal. Um, when we talk about specific goal, what do we really mean? We're talking about who is involved, what do I want to accomplish, where, uh, establish a time frame in which to accomplish the goal, identify the requirements and constraints, and then why, if the specific reasons, purpose, or benefits are of accomplishing the goal. And especially in the context of research, that last one is the key. Why in the world would you want to do this? Because it's going to be a lot of suffering. A general goal would be get in shape. I've used that, and you can tell the effect. It doesn't really work, right? But you could say a specific goal would be to join a health club and work out three days a week. Even better would be to say join a health club, work out three days a week for 30 minutes each time. And it's funny how that works better. But humans are funny. Measurable. I'm going to publish more papers. <laughs> you know, I used to say that back when early in my career. Didn't work. I had so many papers just nearly done. Didn't help. I will publish two papers in a given time period, whatever it is you want to think of. Probably a year for like in your case, you know, two papers a year is not a bad goal to have. It's more important to make the plan measurable than to hit the target. If you miss that target, what did you, what did you, what could you do differently so you could hit that target? It doesn't really matter that you miss it. Don't beat yourself up if you don't make it. Plans are a little importance, but planning is essential. Winston Churchill. You know, attainable and realistic. I could say, like, I will win three Nobel Prizes and the Ig Nobel Prize. Anybody know what the Ig Nobel Prize is? Right? It's, it's better than the Nobel Prize, I think, because you get an award for crazy research um, that's truly creative that when you think about it, it's actually pretty clever. So there's a lot of examples. Was a long time ago, I was into running for, like, pizza dough tossing. The physics of pizza dough tossing, tossing pizza dough across. Yeah, well, anyway. Timely. Um, I'll run the Mission Beach Triathlon. I'm, I really will do it in the year 2055, for example. When in the context of a PhD, you know, or a graduate degree, it's better to focus on quarterly progress, for example, soon enough so you can see what you can change if things go, you don't meet your, your target goals. So that's what it means to be timely. A plan is great, but be ready to throw it out. You can have a great plan, but if things aren't working, then you have to change the plan. And no plan is actually worth the paper it's written on or the screen it appears on. I would guarantee that. But making the plan is what matters because you think about all the things that go wrong and how you would counter those, those issues to move forward. Okay. And I'm not just saying that. Dwight Eisenhower said it, so he's much better at all this than I ever was. So. Okay. Okay. That's that part. I don't know if that helps. Okay. <laughs> what else can we talk about? I don't know. We have any time left? Yeah. yeah Here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What's this like that you've always wanted to show but no one ever asked? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's a good question. I don't know. I, don't, I actually, I'm thinking about this, this particular slide. It says more on being lost and confused. And I actually don't know what's after this slide. It means I'm lost, but. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, this actually slowed, showed the slides that I wanted to show today, believe it or not. Yeah. For this presentation. I mean, one of the things, these set of slides here, what these are about, these are about the sort of questions that you might get for a PhD if, if somebody really wanted to ask you some interesting questions, you know, and didn't have the specific, the specifics of your particular project. Um, you know, so good questions asked. Do you think things are unknowable in your field? What things? What are the current technological limits in your work? Uh, can you see solutions? Where are you currently stuck? How do you talk about what you don't know? Sort of vague 
questions. But on the other hand, the answer, if you can answer these questions and it shows you've thought about the work that you want to do, and then it might actually help unstick you sometimes when you're stuck in a particular issue. What was the main thrust of your last proposal or plan, your next one? What would you like to work on knowing but can't? And then why? Why can't you work on the thing you really want to work on? What's holding you back? It's funny how sometimes people self-select and they decide, well, I, I know I can't work on this particular topic because we don't have X. And then if you just talk to people, you find out, well, I know somebody that actually has it. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's uh, actually asking you know, about the significance of your work. With the context that there are published papers and then there are published papers, meaning that, like Theodore Sturgeon, none of you would know who this guy is, but it's 90% of everything is crap. It's funny how you go through a lot of papers and you read them and like, looks like a fantastic paper based on the title and the abstract and you go through it, what is this, right? And 90% of them are kind of like that and you find a few papers that are actually really good and that's, you ask yourself these questions, you know, what are the key novel findings of your research? What's their impact and how do you communicate these things? And then how much, because of the work that you did, how big will the research output be from everybody as a consequence of the, that particular paper? Who was Theodore Sturgeon? Theodore Sturgeon? Hmm? Who was Theodore Sturgeon? Uh, philosopher, yeah. Uh, understanding, how well do you understand what it is you're doing? You know, if you're a master student, then the idea is to understand it well enough to use it. And the PhD is supposed to be if you understand it well enough to make it reality or to do something entirely new with it. So Albert Einstein was well known for saying, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Right. So if you, can you explain the physical significance? Can you explain the physical meaning of the details. The common place where a lot of, like in this department, if you ever show Navier-Stokes equations or like Kahn equations or whatever, the people, somebody will ask you like, what does that term mean? And ask you to explain the details. And if you don't know, then they'll really drill down and go after you. If you have like examiners like I had when I was doing mine. Yeah. Um, like I said, I'll upload these slides for you to look at, all right? So you can have a look and see if these help you as you think about what you're trying to do. Okay, thank you.